again, the, the, the heart of what we're trying to get to is this idea of we have space. I would like, you know, what's our goal right now? I'm going to continue on. We have this kind of goal. I would like to find some group of vectors, vector one, vector two, up to vector whatever, that span I'd like to find a spanning set. That is somehow this idea of a, a best set or a good set of vectors that span the entire space. And the concepts behind that that we're going to have to worry about is the first concept is we have no say vector threes that are some amount of vector ones plus some amount of vector two. Because if something like this happened is, oh look, if you found a third vector that you said you were you were trying to have something that was say I want the span of v1, v2, and v3. But what is that? That is a bunch of v1s, a bunch of v1s, a bunch of v2s, and then a bunch of v3s, right? But if every V3 that you saw was actually V1s and V2s, you could go ahead and reach right in there and say, oh wait, by the way, I noticed that your third vector is actually your first two vectors put together. Well, since it's a linear combination of a linear combination, it's still a linear combination. So by stuffing it into there, then what's gonna happen is that the span that you would have had is still the span if you would have just used V1 and V2. You could just retry it in and say, let's get rid of all the V3s. Then what do I have? It's a linear combination of V1, V2. Oh, that's the span, right? If you have a linear combination, you have a span. But on the other hand, what would have happened? If I wanted to, I could have actually taken V2 it just simply moved everything to the other side. That would be a V3 minus alpha 1 V1, all multiplied by 1 over alpha 2, right? So that's just a linear combination. So if I wanted to, I could have reached in and gotten rid of all the V2s. Then what would have been left? Yeah, I'd only have V1s and V3s left. But if I wanted to, I could have reached into my problem and said, hey, solve for V1. Let's move all the twos and threes to the other side and have V1 all by itself. Well, if V1 is all by itself, I could go to that V1, get rid of it with all the two, three linear combinations, which means I have a two, three linear combination. Oh, that means it's actually, I don't need these three vectors. That would also be the span of V2, V3. In other words, if you ever have some sort of equation where you can solve for one of the vectors as some linear combination of the others, you can't get anywhere new. That's one way of thinking about it. Like you there, oh, this doesn't give you anywhere new because I, I got the V3 well, what if I use V3? Well, it's the same thing as using V1s and V2s. Why, why do you need it? I mean, think about the ideas of if, if you can make every dollar amount using only one dollar bills, why do you need fives? You might be like, well, I don't want to have a lot of ones. Yeah, but can you make every amount using only ones? If you were a store, 
and everything was paid in dollars. It's a true dollar store, and you make taxes so that after you pay, it's a dollar. What would be the only bill that you need in the store? Ones. Well, what about all the others? Ones do it. Well, why is that? Well, because a five is actually five ones. What's a 20? It's actually 20 ones. <laughs> I don't actually need a 20. I can get by with just using ones. So you don't have to be, I mean, you're really just simply not wanting people to walk home with big giant piles of money, right? It's like, but if you only had two things in your store, what would be the two things that you would need? Actually, uh, actually, let's go way down. If you only had one thing in your store, what would be the one thing that would get every amount possible? Pennies. You have a till that's just a bunch of pennies. It's like, what's my change? <laughs> right? A penny would do everything. Everything else is just, it's a linear combination of pennies. And that's what we're, you know, that's what's happening here is, that, oh, well, look, I, if I have $1 bills and $5 bills and $10 bills, who cares? Ones covers everything. It's a span of the thing that's actually unique. That's what we're considering. And so it's like, you know what? I would not, I would like to not have this. I want uniqueness. What are things that are going to be unique for generating my problem? What's going to have to be true about these two to have uniqueness? <clears throat> A second thing that we would want to have as a concept is that I would like to eventually have the smallest number of these guys. I'd like to have one of them to not be a multiple of the others because he wouldn't be needed, so why wouldn't we just throw it away and keep the others? Now, I'd like to keep doing that until I got the smallest amount. So today, this will be 3.3 is this section. This will be 3.4 when we talk about the smallest number of these guys, which will lead to the concept of dimension. And the last thing that we would like to do is there any way that we can compare two spanning sets such that, let's say that they're both as small as you can get, like one has four and the other has four, but they're different. Is there any way I can look at these and say things like, you know what, how are they related? Why would I pick one over the other one? How are these useful? And what are all the comparisons that can happen here? And this will be basically 3.5 on all of chapter 5. We're eventually going to be saying, okay, you know, what would be the best building blocks if we're going to be making things? Why would you pick this one over this one? All right, 3.3. So that's kind of our hope and our goal as we move on. But 3.3, linear independence. So the idea is, if I would give you, say for example, you have the span of four vectors, v1, v2, v3, v4. So I'm just going to do the span irregardless of spanning set. And is it possible that one of the vectors is some multiple of, you know, scale, linear combination of the others? When would this happen and when would it not and how can I tell the difference? Okay, I would like to have, okay, you really have a vector, it's all by itself, some of the others are on the other side. Let's look at this a little bit differently. Let's do what we would do, say, in college algebra, and when we talk about things like roots, right? We would like to know, really, does this equality exist? 
one way of looking at that is, what would this look like if I moved everybody to one side and left nothing on the other side? So, I have this V3 is equal to V1 plus 2V2 minus a V4. If I would move everything to the left, but actually right and then flip over, because I like a positive. So a positive V1, a positive 2V2, a minus V3, and a minus V4, what's left on the other side? The zero vector, right? It's, this is vector operators, so there's a zero vector on the other side. All right, let's take a time out for a second. So this is really this, but this is really Look familiar? So saying that you have a vector that's some multiple of the other vectors is the same thing as saying that if I had those vectors, they have a non-trivial homogeneous solution. There's a non-trivial solution. There's some combinations of them that spits out a zero. There's always one combination that always works, right? What would be the one combination that always spits out zero? zero. The trivial. To have a quote unquote badness, this idea of, oh, there's some dependency going on here, means that we have something besides all zeros. It actually has a non trivial solution. So when we look at this, we've just simply restated the problem. Hey, this is bad because this guy is a linear combination of those guys. What does that mean? It really means that this has a non-trivial solution. There's a trivial solution. Zero of the first, zero of the second, zero of the third, zero of the fourth is zero. That's trivial, that's always true. But it actually has one, two, negative one, negative one is also zero. So that means we have solving systems of equations again to answer this problem. And so that's what we'll do if this is true, we'll call it linearly dependent. If this is not true, it only has a trivial solution, we'll call it linearly independent. In other words, they can't be written as multiples of one another. So that's our definition. Definition. One. V1, V2, up to Vn are linearly independent, which means they cannot be written as multiples of each other. If C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus everything up to Cn, Vn, equal to zero object, has only trivial solution, which is C1 equals zero, C2 equals zero, Cn equals zero. This is obviously, that line right there is obviously a system of equations of some sort. But the important is, a multiple of the first object, a multiple of the, a linear combinations of the objects set to the homogeneous has only the trivial solution. So when you go to solve it, you only get all zeros. If that's true, they're linearly independent. One of the ideas, think about linearly independence, is everybody is important. Everybody has a part of themselves that is unique compared to the others. 
You're not sitting here like, oh, the number five is a bunch of ones. It's like, no. This object is unique to itself. There's something special about it that makes it a non-combination of the others. The second thing is, well, dependence. The V1, V2, Vn are linearly dependent, which means they can be written as a multiple of each other. If, again, what do you do? You take the C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus everything at the Cn, Vn equals zero object, has some non-trivial solution, which really means one of the Ci is not zero. One of those constants cannot be, I mean, one of those is not zero, we're good. So the heart of this definition is we took what does it mean to be a multiple of each other and turned it into an equation that we can solve. Now for this, at any time did I specify the vector space? No. You know, the vector spaces could be true vectors, right? Like one, two, three, but it actually could be any of the vector spaces. Because, oh, look, you're in polynomial space. Well, is this polynomial and this polynomial and this polynomial linearly independent? What does that mean? Something times the first plus something times the second plus something times the third equaling the zero object, which is the zero, 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 right? Does, well, how many solutions does this have? And so what about matrix space? Something times the first and something times the second, right? You just put some constants in there and you try to solve it. And you have to interpret like, well, what are my objects? So this, you need to be able to take this thing here and deal with any type of V and any type of constant. If the vectors are polynomials, how would you do this? If the vectors are matrices, how would you do this? If the vectors are continuous functions, how would you do this? And we go through that each time. And now they answer the question of linear independence. Now, any vector space. So I could do things like, let's take, you know, classic, let's say V1 is made up of 1, 1, 0, and V2 is equal to uh, 3, 0, 1. And if the question is, are they linearly independent. What does linear independence mean? It means that is one, are they are there unique parts of each other, but it really simply says is something times the first plus something times the second becoming the zero object, which is obviously the zero object. Does this have more than the trivial solution? Obviously, we always have the trivial solution. Plug a zero in here, plug a zero in here, it's obviously zero. I mean, we always have a trivial solution. In other words, does it have more than that? Well, 
we're going to have to solve for C1, C2. If you have answers besides 0, 0, what would happen? What would you say? They're dependent. If you only have 0, 0, you say independent. Everybody's unique. All right, how do I solve that? Just start plugging it in, right? C1 plus 3C2, C1, C2 is supposed to be equal to 0, 0, 0. <laughs> By observation, what's C1? 0. What's C2? 0. Plug in 0, 0, 0. <laughs> if I solve this, C1 equals 0, C2 equals 0, only. There's no other numbers that this would ever spit out. So, what does that mean? They're independent. The only way this will ever be home, the only way to get a zeros out of this is, is using zero. Let's have an example of say dependence and see what that would look like. Um, let's say we're in P3, and so the first polynomial I have is. 2x minus 1. The second polynomial I have is x squared plus 1. And the third polynomial I have is 2, sorry, not 2, but actually, yeah. 2x squared plus 2x plus 1. Are these independent of one another? Or is one of them some multiple of the other? In other words, it's like one of these polynomials is actually made up of the others. Well, the answer is yes, because I did it. <laughs> right? But how do we check? We check to say, hey, do you have so many of the first and then so many of the second, and then so many of the third, and when is this the zero object? What's the zero object of P3 space? I don't know why I put a cube in there. It's what? Zero x squared. 0x, zero, 0. That's my 0 object. This, let's move it down one row here. What does this represent? This represents something times your first vector plus something times your second vector plus, I don't know why I'm putting that so far over, plus something times your third vector is supposed to be the 0 object. Right? This is always what we have. So much of the first, so much of the second, so much of the third, so much of however many you have is supposed to be the zero object. I know one answer is obviously zero, 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 spits out zeros. That's the trivial solution. Do I have more than that? Is there any other linear combination that's also true? In other words, solving it. Well, this is a college algebra problem. How do you solve polynomials? How do you solve polynomial equations? Group like terms. You group like terms. How many x squareds are on the left? I see C2 plus 2C3 x squareds. How many x's do you see? Two C one plus two C three X's. How many constants do you see? Negative C one plus C two plus C three constants. And what is this supposed to be equal to? How do you solve polynomials? Like things are like. 
So for this equality to be true, says that for the x squared terms, c2 plus 2c3 is supposed to be what? Zero. Zero. For the x terms, 2c1 plus 2c3 is supposed to be? Zero. And for the constant terms, negative c1 plus c2 plus c3 is supposed to be? Zero. Zero. It ends up that what type of problem do I have? System of linear equations. <laughs> I have to solve this. How many ways can you solve it? Substitution, elimination, augmented matrices. Which one do you want to do? Augmented matrix? What would this look like as a matrix? Okay, and what would be the easiest thing to do first? We could divide that by two, switch the order, and just get one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, two, zero, negative one, 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 zero. Then what would you do? Just add one and three. If I add one and three, that becomes what? One, zero, one, zero, zero, one, two, zero, and? And what's that? <coughs> All right, now we can pop, stop right now, interpret this for me. This is C1s, this is C2s, this is C3s. That is a 1 in that position. That is a 1 in that position. What does that tell you about C1 and C2? They are lead. Why does that make C3? Free. If C3 is free, what values can it take on? Anything. C3 is a free variable. So what numbers can I plug into it? Anything you want, including non-zero. Free variable says how many solutions are there? Infinite. Right? So this is a free variable. There's nothing I need to do. So infinite solutions. Which means what? Linearly dependent. One of them is a multiple of the other. What did I do? I just took two of the one, one of the other, and added them together. Naturally, if you look at that equation, what did I do? Two of the one, and added them together. Anyways. So the heart of this problem, when you keep checking, is always, can you solve that? Now. There is a specific restriction that we can do. If we decide this, looking at this thing, so many of the first vector, so many of the second vector, so many, how many vectors do you have? Take a linear combination, set them equal to the zero object, solve it. If there's only the trivial solution, independent. If you have more than that, dependent. And I can do this for any vector space. But on the other hand, if I would restrict myself to the following problem, We're talking about nth dimensional space, and so this is Rn, and we consider one vector, a second vector, nth vectors. 
So if I'm in R3, I'm only going to talk about three vectors. If I'm talking about R5, I'm always going to talk about five vectors. What that does, if this is true, then a constant times the first vector you're looking at, a constant times the second vector you're looking at, a constant times the nth vector you're looking at equaling the zero object, right? And then I write this in the following way, that this is x1, x2, xn, multiplying c1, c2, cn is supposed to be the zero object. If each of these is in Rn, that means it has n elements. And how many columns do we have? n. So this thing as a matrix is square. This is n by n. This is n by n. If I wanted to tighten it up a little bit, if I call this guy capital X and I call this by guy C, then this thing looks like capital X C <coughs> is the zero object, which happens to be a, this guy here is n by n, right? It's a square matrix. And the problem was, uh, do I have any non-trivial solutions? But do we have those theorems? If you have non-trivial solutions, that really means that x is invertible, and we have a technique to check if x is invertible. What is that? It's square. What tool can we use to see if this thing has an inverse? The determinant. So if you're in nth dimensional space, and you're considering n vectors, it's a very special problem that looking for solutions, we could short circuit that and say, hey, we could actually use the determinant. Having, so having a trivial solution, having a non-trivial solution is actually means singular, non-singular. So, <coughs> having non-trivial solutions means x, which is again this x1, x2, xn is singular. Having only trivial solution means x is non-singular. And so we could get the following, put that into a theorem. X made up of the vectors you're looking at. And these are in Rn. So we have n vectors in nth space in Rn. We have the following. We have linearly independent means we could check if and only if x is non-singular, which really means that the determinant of it isn't zero. But that means we have linearly dependent if and only if x is singular, which means that the determinant of this thing is zero. So this is a special tool I can use. If it's square, if you're in Rn and you're having n vectors, you could use the determinant if you want. Let's say My first vector is 1, 0, 1. My second vector is 2, 2, 0. And my third vector is um, 1, 2, minus 1. 
These are all in, obviously, R3. So you look at and you check. What's your dimension? Three space, how many vectors? Three space. So if I wanted to just use the theorem, we would just simply have to go ahead and check. What's the determinant of 1, 0, 1, 2, 2, 0, 1, 2, negative 1? What technique do you want to use? If we did a cofactor expansion, we would pick the guy that has the most number of zeros, which would probably be like that one, and then do a cofactor expansion. Or you could do determinant by elimination. If I wanted to do determinant by elimination, I would do what? So everybody can do the cofactor expansion. What's determinant by elimination? Go ahead. And I want to make this diag triangular, right? So this, how would I make that 1 a 0? I subtract row 1. What would that do to the determinant? Nothing. That's a type 3 uh, row op. So it doesn't mess with the determinant at all. And if I subtract row 1, what do I get? What does that mean? <coughs> They're linearly dependent. Do you see the dependence? What is U2 minus U1? It's U3. U3 is nothing new. <laughs> it's actually U2 minus U1. So it wasn't a new vector. And we found it. The determinant is 0, so... This is linearly dependent. Eventually we'll get and use how we can look at the matrix and answer some questions about it on what's happening. But anyways. This only works for this one special case. If you're a polynomial space, continuous functional space, matrix space, vector space where you don't have enough vectors or too many. What if I have five vectors in R3? You, you can't take a determinant. What if, I have two de what if I have two vectors in R3? You obviously cannot do it. Determinants are square. I have to have a square matrix. So there's nothing you can do. You have to go all the way back to say, so many of the first, so many of the second, set it equal to zero, solve. You have to do it the long way. Now, so that's a special version. Um, one important theorem here on linear independence Three, three, two, and so we're we're going to go back to any vector <coughs> space. So that was the special case. Now we're talking about any vector space at all, and so we're going to be given some vectors in this vector space, and the following happens. Vector 1, vector 2, up to vector n are linearly independent if and only if. Logic, what this means for a, a theorem, if you say something is if and only if, means that these things are logically equivalent. They mean the same thing. That means if you have linear independence, you have the second property. If you have the second property, you also have linear independence. Now normally we're going to have ind independence has this nice property, and so it goes both ways. Uh, what happens if we have linear independence is for any vector that's in the span, so we have a linear combination of these vectors. can be uniquely written as this vector 
is equal to so many of vector 1 plus so many of vector 2 plus so many of vector n. That is a very important word. So I have the span. It's a subspace. I pick an object that's in my subspace. What this says is you go back to these vectors, which happen to be linearly independent. So if I have linearly independent vectors, every one of them is important. I have a subspace which is made up of the span. So I have some vector that exists out in there. So here is my vector space. In here is the span of V1, Vn, which obviously is a subspace. And I got some vector that's in here. So I got my subspace in Z and in V. If these VI are linearly independent of one another, that means when I go back and say, how do I get to V? Well, you're going to need so many VI, you're going to need so many V2, and you're going to need so many VN. Each of those amounts are unique. If each of those amounts are unique, Think about this now in terms of like, let's say, positional numbers. I write things like 1, 2, 3. What does that mean? That means 100 plus 2 tens plus 3. Why do we only write 1, 2, 3? Why don't we use the whole words? Because this uniquely defines this amount of stuff. We write down only the parts that are interesting to us. How much of this do you need? How much of this do you need? How much of this do you need to make the entire thing? In other words, these act as coordinates. What are coordinates? Coordinates are really instructions on how much do you need of each to get somewhere. Think of back to, say, three space when you say things like, oh, this is the coordinate, say, one, two, one. What does that really mean? It says you need one x, you need two y's, and you need one Z, so it's a one, one, right? You said you needed one of the one, zero, zero. You need two of the zero, one, zeros. You need one of the zero, zero, ones. And that will uniquely get you to this place. No other values ever will get you to this place. And if those are unique, let's just write those. And so those act as coordinates. So that would mean that if I have linear independence, the coordinates are what I ought to write down. How much do you need of every vector to get where you want to go? So every location in space would have, how'd you get there? This many V1s, this many V2s, this many V3s, get me there. Oh, so I'll just keep the this many's and I'll call them coordinates. Because uniqueness, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n can be considered as coordinates. Obviously, the coordinates are dependent upon the vectors that get you there. It's like if you write numbers in base 3 or you write numbers in base 10, you know, what you write might get you to the same quantity, but there's different coordinates that do that for you. If I give you a bunch of vectors in some sort of vector space, what do we do to, and this is any vector space, all right, at all, so to check for linear independence, what do we do? We just simply take a combination of these guys. 
set it equal to the zero object, and see what? I solve it. What am I guaranteed for always one answer? All zeros for constants, that's the trivial solution. And so what happens is, is if we have only the trivial solution, which means ci equals zero for all i, then what is it? It's linearly independent. Every vector matters, think about it that way. No vector is a multiple of a bunch of the other vectors. It's no linear combination of the others. On the other hand, if we have some non-trivial solution, which means one of those constants is not zero when we solve it, what does that mean? It's linearly dependent. One of these guys is some <coughs> linear combination of the others and it didn't need to be there. The thing that we stopped on was each of these can be done for, like how do we do it for matrix space, how do we do it for normal, R to the N, you know, vector space. What do we do for polynomial space? This equation is pretty, is straightforward and easy to handle for those. The only one that it's going to be weird on is continuous functional space. Because you look at it and if it's a continuous function, our biggest issue is the zero object is just the number zero. You know, polynomial space allowed us to group like things and we would get to solve for when we solve if I have a bunch of constants to solve for, I need that many equalities to eventually solve for this. If not, it's underdetermined and it, you know, we don't know how to progress in our problem. So the only one that we stopped on last time, and if you take uh, differential equations or you're currently taking differential equations or you've had taken differential equations, one of the things that happens in Diffie-Q is you solve a differential equation that says, oh look, like here's a straightforward example in differential equations. It says, take a function, add the second derivative of that function, and you should get zero. And Diffie-Q is a cookbook course where it's like, hmm, guess an answer, check it. If it works, you found an answer. So it's guess and check, guess and check for a lot of things. Like, well, what if it doesn't look like this? And so you learn every chapter as well. If they look like this, they probably have this. And if it looks like this, it probably has it. Well, it doesn't look like that. Well, all right, start using some algebra, some substitution, play around with it a little bit. Oh, it looks like that. It has this solution. It's very much a course along the lines of, hey, let's just dig our way through one at a time in terms of pattern recognition. And one of these, when we look at it and say, hey, are there any functions that you know that when you take its first derivative and then its second derivative, that the second derivative is just the first function but a sine flip. What's your derivative of sine? What's your derivative of cosine? It's negative sine. Oh, its second derivative is the first function except of di uh, except their additive inverses. And so one person could say, you know, I notice that f could be sine. On the other hand, someone else says, well, f could be cosine. Well, I have two answers. Well, how do I put the two answers? And then you ask yourself, well, are they two answers? Are they completely different? In other words, is one function actually the other function by adding and subtracting and multiplying? In other words, it's always possible that a person says, oh, look, I have a solution, and I have a second solution, and I have a third solution. And, and pers person, another person kind of comes up and says, no, no, you, don't, you only have two. Well, why? I found three functions. Well, the third function is the first two functions added. You didn't find anything new. And so that's the question of independence. And so how do you check independence in differential equations? They automatically introduced the Ron skin. What's the Ron skin? Well, the Ron skin is simply how do I check in continuous functional space? So I have a bunch of continuous functions over some interval. And I ask for, what does it mean to be linearly independent? Well, these are functions. So I would like to have a constant times the first function, a constant times the second function, a constant times the third func nth function, 
spits out the number zero, which is the zero object of continuous function. If I would look at the example from above, that would look like, hey, something times sine x plus something times cosine x equals zero. Please solve for C1, C2, and the answer is I cannot. I need more than one equation. Polynomials ended up accidentally, like nicely forming when you set them, because the zero object on the other side was not zero. It was zero plus zero x plus zero x squared plus, oh, it actually was a system of equations that I could solve. It actually was a bunch of equalities, not one. This is one equality. There's no way I can solve this. So the Ronskin's introduction to this is, if this can't be solved, let's put one extra restriction on my problem, which is I need to be able to take the derivative. And if I would take the derivative, if these were all differentiable, so this all of a sudden throws away not all functions are allowed to be an answer. I would restrict it and say, oh no, no, they have to have a first derivative. Well, what does differential do for the left-hand side? It just goes to the function. If I take a first derivative, that will be just f1 prime, f2 prime, fn prime is still equal to zero. That's the idea of being what's called smooth. You know, it's like, oh look, it has, if you have a first derivative, right, there's no vertical asymptotes or things like that. You actually have a slope. But if I look at it and I say, well, I have more unknowns than equations, we put in another restriction. Take another derivative. In other words, not only does the first derivative exist, the second derivative needs to exist. And so we go through and take the second derivative. And we just keep on going until we have enough functions, which means you're going to go to the n minus first derivative. This can be solved. It's now a system of equations. So if this was our example, how many unknowns did we have? Two, because we only have two functions. So what do we need to do? We would just simply take the first derivative alone. Then what does this look like? This will be a matrix made up of F1, F2, up to Fm. The very next row is the first derivatives. The last row will be the n minus first derivatives. I would have my constants here. And it needs to be the zero, just a bunch of zeros. So what does it look like here? This looks like sine x, cosine x, cosine x, minus sine x times C1, C2 is supposed to be zero, zero. Now, this object is sine, once you plug x in, is actually a real number. So this thing is actually a matrix of reals, I just don't know what the reals are yet. Right? It's just like, what x's go in? Well, what are the x's of, of my, you know, from A to B? And so what space do I need? Well, we changed our notation from just C. Continuous functional spaces say just the top row exists. But if I'm going to check, I need to have the first derivative, the second derivative, and so what we do is we modify this a little bit and just put an n minus 1 up there, which simply says that's how many derivatives need to be continuous. So some of these, like sine and cosine, are infinitely differentiable. Polynomials are infinitely differentiable, and after a certain point, they're all zero. So certain functions are nice. You take derivatives, and we always have values coming out of it. And saying that not only do you have the position, but the slope, and the curvature, and the 
Okay, let me see. If we would put physics terms, position, velocity, acceleration, snap, crackle, pop are the higher derivatives. And I didn't know that. Somebody told me once, and it was like, a, that's from studying uh, roller coasters. Acceleration makes sense. And then it goes, so you go, yeah, so velocity, acceleration, wait, sorry, the velocity, acceleration, jerk, snap, crackle, pop. A change in acceleration in car, what do you notice it does? It jerks. Well, if you think you're studying roller coasters, what would you like to minimize? Jerks. Why do you think the next ones are called snap, crackle, pop? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine what happens if you have a change in jerk. That's probably not healthy. You would like to have, I would like not only acceleration to be something that's like not 10G where you pass out, you'd also like to not have heavy jerks. You want to have jerks, but not bad jerks, and you definitely don't want getting up to the other changes. That's probably going to kill you. So it's like, okay, we'll avoid that. <laughs> Anyways, so we go through these. These are nice, smooth curves. Is what we're basically restricting ourselves to is just curves that have derivatives, and so we can work it out. But now the question is, how do I understand that matrix? If it was real numbers, what would be the rule? The matrix square, right? It would be a square matrix, and so linear independence shifts to what theorem? If it's a square matrix of real numbers, use the determinant. It's a square matrix of real numbers, use the determinant. If the determinant is zero, good question. And what if the determinant is not zero? It's linearly independent, right? It has an inverse, it's invertible. So when I look at this, and I notice that to study this, this is a square matrix of real numbers. I just don't know what the numbers are yet. And so normally, we'd use the determinant not equal to zero to show linear independence. Now, one way of looking at this though is this is a matrix of reals, but I don't know the reals because it has x's. So it's not just simply a matrix, it's a lot of matrices. And so all of these matrices, when you would look at it, would be things like, okay, how, how does this work out? It's like, if it is, one way of looking at it is if it's ever not zero, because I have all the x's I could pick, if at any particular time I found any x at all that this would not be zero, it would be linearly independent. And so what we do is we just go ahead and throw this thing into, go ahead and calculate the determinant. And so that's what we do is let's go ahead and take the determinant of this thing. And this thing would look like, so f1, but remember it's a function of x. f2, remember it's a function of x, and we keep on going down. So we have fn, a function of x, and this is the, then we take derivatives going down. We take all these derivatives. But remember that these are all functions of x. If you take this determinant, it's going to be a function of x. Won't be pretty but it will be a function of x. So imagine this guy right here, right? What's that determinant? Well, for this one, we're actually kind of lucky. It's a function of x, but what does it actually spit out? Well, it's a two by two. So how do you calculate the determinant? Cross, multiply, subtract. What's the main diagonal? Negative sine squared. What's the other one? Negative cosine squared. What's negative sine squared plus a negative cosine squared? That's negative sine squared plus cosine squared, which is? So it's minus one, it's actually, but that's a function of x, right? For all x values, what would this put out? Negative one. So actually it's nice that, hey, for all x values, this is never zero. And I just needed one. If at any time this is not zero, we have linear independence. Well, that one's never zero. Well, what if it's sometimes zero and sometimes not zero? Well, gotta, yeah, you have some work to do. We just need to have, is it ever not zero? Now, if you would do all of this work, take the determinant, write this out, 
this thing will end up being a function of x and the shorthand way that I normally write this is I write w, I write f sub i to represent the functions, and then I just write of x. It's a function. We'll have some, like the one example we had, it was minus 1, that's a function. It could have been, say, negative 1x. And say, well, for any time between negative infinity and infinity, is the curve minus x ever not zero? Uh, yeah. How about all values <laughs> except for zero? We seem to have one where this is true. And the name of this thing, once you do all this work, is called the Ronskian. And then what happens here is the following theorem. If for any x, that's where you're looking, the Ronskian is not zero, then we have linear independence of the functions. So you got to just look at this function. If it's, is there any time it's not zero, that implies linear independence. Note, this is not if and only if. This is not log logical equivalency. It's possible for the Ronskian to be, just like when you took the sine and the cosines, right? The, you took its determinant and you got a negative one. If you take the determinant and it spits out zero, it's identically zero. It does not mean that they're actually dependent. This is strictly a test for independence. That's it. If it's not zero, it's independent. What if it is zero? I've learned nothing because this is not if and only if. This is implication. If it's not zero, it's independent. Well, what if it is zero? Tests don't apply. You've learned nothing. Which really says your Ronskian test didn't work. So if your Ronskian test doesn't work, what would be a different technique? So if it's identically zero, there's nothing for me to do. Uh, the Ronskian failed, and I haven't learned anything. Another technique is if we have f1, f2, up to fn. And so what I have here is these curves from a to b, and there's, say, there's f1, there's f2, down here's fn. And I'd like to know, are these linearly <coughs> independent? And let's say that you don't want to do the Ronskian, or you've done the Ronskian, and it failed. It came out identically zero, which means that uh, I don't know what to do. Right, it only works if it's not zero, then it says independence. If it's identically zero, it tells you nothing. So it's like, okay, what do I do? And the issue is, if you have C1, F1, plus C2, F2, plus everything up to Cn, Fn, is equal to zero, I have one equation with too many unknowns. And this is functions of x. So the question is, how can I get this into a system that would be something that is solvable. So what you do is you do the following thing. How many functions do you have? And then just simply go across from left to right and pick sample points. You would just go across and say, you know what, I'm going to pick, say, this x, and then this x, and then that x, and then that x, and we just keep going across. And what we're doing is we're picking, say, x1, we're picking x2, we're picking x3, we're picking x4 across. If I do that, then for every one of these, what does x1 give you? It says c1 f of x1 plus c2 f, sorry, f1, f2 of x2 plus cn f n of x, this is x1, equals 0. So what I do is I look at those points, and now this becomes, this is the heights of every one of those. So that becomes a number c1, a number c2, a number c3, a number cn. And then what do I do? Do the same thing for x2. 
and I would get, hey, what's C1 times F1 of X2 plus C2 times F2 of X2 plus Cn F n of x that's a 1, that's a 2 equals 0. And so I sampled those places. So what you do is you look across and you try to you think of what would be the points that seem to be most unique to this function. And then just sample them. And then just plug those numbers in. And if it shows linear independence, they're linearly independent. That's the problem with continuous functions is we don't have enough equations. We have to make them. Yep. So do you always have to draw it out and see? Well, I mean, you don't have to draw, but it helps. I mean, because it's just values, right? So one of the things that happens for this one is what's the bit, one of the bigger issues for the Ronskian is the fact that it needs to be smooth. It needs to be differentiable, right? Well, what happens if the curves that you're dealing with are things like this? Let's say one curve is that, another curve is that, and another curve is this one. Like I have the absolute value on this. Those are not differentiable. So I can't even apply the idea of the Ron skin because I can't even take the derivative because I have sharp corners. So what do I have to do? Well, if I have three equations, I would just pick three sample points and check. And if it, if it ends up being having a non true, I'm sorry, if it only has a trivial solution, then they're linearly independent. The book has an example for that. And they pick, you know, sharp cornered thing that has no derivative, so you can't use a round scan. 